How many folks here are from Nashville? Wow. How many folks are from outside of Nashville? Wow. How many people here are from outside of the country? We got a few in the back. Nice. Well, my name is Stephen Olikar. I'm the founder and president of the Millennial Action Project. We're a national nonpartisan organization working with young elected officials to bridge the political divides in our country and to enact systemic reforms to make our democracy function better. Today, we've got an amazing discussion lined up for all of you uh, with two of the leading political commentators in our country. So let's bring them out. First of all, we have writer, commentator, and author of 13 New York Times bestsellers, Ann Coulter. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Ann. Uh, right in the middle. Right in the middle. Oh, okay. Thank you. And r another writer and commentator and writer at The Atlantic. Give a big round of applause for David Frum. All right. How are we feeling? Great. Yeah. So good to be here. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, I commented that both of you are authors. And David, in the past, you've actually comment, uh, commented about Anne's book on immigration, yeah. that it was perhaps one of the most politically uh, influential books in our country around the issue of immigration. So let me start with you, David. W why did you make that comment? Well, I, I said it was the most directly politically influential because Anne had written this book about immigration that Don Donald Trump had read. Donald Trump at that point was known for really one point of view, which is his advocacy of trade protectionism. He had, that had been his signature issue since the 80s. Um, I think he found Anne's book and found his idea. Um, and that was the idea that he, he rode to overcome the Republican field. What had happened in um, uh, the aftermath of the Great Recession was that Republican voters had decided what we want is more health care, less immigration, and no more Bushes. And the Republican establishment said, right, got it, more immigration, right. less health care, and one more Bush. And that, so it was a rotten floorboard, and Ann showed Donald Trump uh, the way to um, pierce it. For, from my point of view, tragic consequences for the country, but great consequences for Ann, because she became really a kingmaker. And we're, we're going to dig into that. So the, one of the main topics we'll touch on today is immigration. And in terms of format, this is just going to be an informal uh, conversation. Now, both of you leading into the Trump years and during the Trump years have been immigration hawks. But since Trump has been elected, you've diverged on your views on the administration's policies on immigration. One of those big differences is on the wall itself. So I'll start with you, Anne. First of all, what did it feel like to have the soon-to-be president reading your book, agreeing with a lot of your views? And why do you think uh, he has agreed with you on a lot of these topics? The strange thing is why no other Republicans would just pick up this obviously popular issue. Americans, every time immigration has been put to a vote, I mean, going back to the 70s, Americans have voted for less legal immigration and a complete stop to illegal immigration. And Paul, it's just like Brexit, except we've been putting up with it through the 70s, or since the 70s. So it's been decade after decade after decade. I completely agree with what David just said. This is what the Republican Party would not deliver. Now, when they run for office, oh, they'd promise to get tough on immigration. In many famous instances, um, one of the most egregious that I think was one of the many incidents that led to Donald Trump was in 2014, Obama's president, Republicans are a minority. How did Republicans take a majority in the Senate in 2014? Well, that was when Obama was threatening to issue his executive order on dreamers, um, which he had spent the previous four or <laughs> four years telling, telling immigration activist groups, I can't do that, that would be unconstitutional. So the constitutional law professor himself said what he was doing by executive order was unconstitutional. Mitch McConnell, the Republican Senatorial Committee, Lamar Alexander, all of them go out and say, vote for us and we, will, we have a lot of ways to block Obama's executive amnesty. We go out, we vote for them, and did they follow through? No, they did not. They did absolutely nothing. And to this day, I mean, Trump has done nothing either. Um, but Americans had been betrayed, betrayed, betrayed. Uh, it is weird that Trump is the only one to say, hey, I know, I'll run on a popular issue. <laughs> 
Now, let's go to David. You obviously disagree with a yeah. lot of what the Trump administration has been doing. One of those big things you disagree with is the wall. So first tell us why you think generally he's read the issue wrongly, and then why do you think the wall is incorrect? Well, I don't, that, that for me, that's not one of my big pr problems with the Trump administration. The wall is obviously a, a foolish idea. The airplane has been invented. Um, uh, but uh, my, my, my d dissent goes sort of deeper. I mean, I see Donald Trump as simply, he's a con man, uh, he's a criminal, he's beholden to foreign interests, he shouldn't be president. My vision about how, why immigration was such an important issue was that if we are going to cope with what globalization has done to advance societies and not succumb to people like Donald Trump, not vote for things like Brexit. Uh, you have to build a society with a stronger sense of national identity, so thicker bonds between citizens. So that means more social provision. It's going to mean something like a national health insurance program, something I've been an advocate of for now a while. Um, and you can only do that if people have an idea, well, we're not underwriting this for the planet or forever who shows up, that we're the claim that we are making upon each other is precisely a claim as citizens. And that has to be, by the way, it's very important that that be racially and ethnically neutral because Americans will not vote for this as a matter of the supremacy of one group, group to another. And I just, I, I watch with horror with Don, Donald Trump, everything he touches, he discredits. Um, and his, by, by the fact that he took up this issue and associated it with himself, that we now have made it more difficult to come up with a responsible approach to immigration. Immigration numbers actually went up during the Trump years, especially in the first half of 2019. And we are going to make it more difficult to therefore to solve all the other problems that need to be solved if societies are to be saved from the kind of self-harm that so many advanced societies are doing to themselves. Right, right. Now let's dig a little bit. In. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. To, I, I think that's a beautiful point and it shouldn't be lost your citizen point, that we are part of a family, that's the American family. And there have been studies on this that people are less inclined to vote for, um, you know, all kinds of, you know, social programs when they don't feel a connection, when there's, you know, diversity is supposed to be such a wonderful thing. No, in fact, studies and the authors like the um, Robert Putnam study out of Harvard, he was the bowling alone guy, he did study after study. People feel less cohesiveness the more diverse um, their town is, their community is, they participate less, they're not interested in civic values. So I don't want David's point on, on the importance of feeling like we're a family together in some sense, not exactly like your own family, but you feel a little closer to your family, your extended family, your neighbors. We are all Americans. I think that's a great point. Um, as for, and that was exactly what I was worried about when Trump came down the escalator, his second point, that Trump has now discredited important ideas. I think that's not true, um, but that was absolutely the fear, which is why even though two days after he came down the escalator with the uh, Mexican rapist speech, as I fondly refer to it, um, I, I did go on real time with Bill Maher and say I thought he'd be the nominee because at least he was talking about it, not in precisely the terms I would have put it, um, but he was talking about an issue that no other Republican would raise. Sometimes Democrats would raise it but not follow through. So for a couple of weeks I wasn't for Trump, for one thing, I was expecting him to back away. But for another thing, I mean, I, I was rather concerned. Is he going to raise this issue? He'll lose because, you know, he's a, a coarse vulgarian, but they will claim he lost because of the issues. Well, no, because he won, I will tell you, the world has changed in a big way. I don't want him to hear this because I, I'm going to keep trolling him and attacking him until he fulfills his promises to the voters. Um, but even if he doesn't fulfill his promises to the voters, which is an outrageous betrayal and should not be forgiven, um, even if he does not, the world has changed in a way that is I'm very sensitive to. I think if I say it, you'll be sensitive to, because back in the 2000s when McCain was pushing amnesty and Bush was pu pushing amnesty, and then McCain comes along and, or rather, Rubio runs for Senate in Florida, promising on his mother's life that he would not come out for amnesty, gets to the Senate, and what's the first thing he does? I got an amnesty bill. So after being betrayed, 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 um, it could, it could have, he could have queered the deal. It would have been blamed on him pushing popular issues. Back then in the 2000s, I could count on one hand the number of people in the conservative media 
who were with the people, on, with the voters on immigration. It was David from me, Mickey Kaus. Um, there were a, a couple LA talk radio hosts. There was Joyce Kaufman in Florida. Fox News was pedal to the metal for amnesty. Most of the talk radio hosts, most of the conservative names, and for the conservatives out there um, in the audience, names you would know that I'm not going to mention. They were absolutely 100% for amnesty. They were dark days. We thought it was over. We have nobody on our side. That has changed 180 degrees. Now I drive around listening to talk radio and radio hosts who not only never talked about immigration, but if they did, they were completely against or, you know, for amnesty and for, you know, we have to do this, have to, oh, how are we going to get the Hispanic vote? Um, now they're practically reading from Adios America, point after point after point. Look at how Fox News has flipped. I, I mean, that, what, that little episode I was just describing where Republicans get us to vote for them in 2014, we vote for them because they promised to block Obama's executive amnesty. They betray us. Mickey Kaus, one of the ones I just mentioned, wrote an article for which he got fired from the Daily Caller, just recording what, what was on Fox News primetime every night as Democrats were filibustering the bill. Nothing about amnesty. Fox was not alerting the troops. They wanted amnesty. You'll also recall, probably because of immigration, Rupert Murdoch wanted to stop Trump. Um, it famously leaked before the first Fox News debate that Rupert Murdoch had called over and said, this has gone on long enough. Thus, we get that little exchange with Megyn Kelly. That was supposed to shut Trump down. And instead, poll after poll after poll, he won. Why? Because of immigration. But, but the, story, the story of the Trump years is a story of a Republican Party that, that wins more and more of less and less. And it's true that Fox News and talk, talk radio have consolidated behind the Trump approach, but it, they are an ever-dwindling part of America. Um, the, the way this kind of change, a, a re-knitting of the civic compact, um, strengthening bonds between citizens, would ever happen, um, the way you would get the con social permission, the national civic permission to enforce the law and to Re, um, taper off the flow of numbers to a more sustainable level, which is not zero, by the way. Um, immigration is not a binary issue. You want it's, it's a matter of more or less, and who and what kind and in what order. Um, the way you get that is with a, a law that is going to, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan said about health care, will pass the Senate 70 to 30, or it won't pass at all. The, the Trump method, which is about self-seeking always, is about polarizing because the only way he can mobilize people behind him is to make him, them so angry at their opponents that they don't look at him. And that's going on right now with this Im impeachment process. So where I think we're going to end up, um, because of Donald Trump, is we're going to end up with um, some executive action on immigration of a kind that has been so brutal as to radicalize in the opposite way people who might potentially have supported a humane approach. Um, high numbers have flowed now through the um, uh, asylum-seeking system rather than through the regular immigration system. And the, any kind of hope for a cross-party consensus ha has been broken. Um, Republicans are radicalized behind their positions. Uh, Democrats have been radicalized even more. Uh, the kinds of things, I mean, you, what are, if you quote things that Barack Obama said in his second book about immigration, people uh, don't mention who the author was, people will be shocked because of where the Democratic Party was in 2007 on the immigration issue and where it is now. And that's something to do with the internal work of the Democratic Party, but it's something to do with Donald Trump. We can't solve any problem unless we have a strong sense of national cohesion, um, of sympathy, not only solidarity, and, and, but sympathy, um, of respect for each other. We can't solve anything. Uh, because of the, uh, it's not a parliamentary system. It's things have to go through the House and the Senate. They have to be enforced by the states. Uh, immigrate the agencies have to have buy-in. You have to build a real consensus. And if you have a governing approach that is about in, in, inflammation, enrage, um, and locking people ever deeper into their uh, respective silos, so that they never. They, they, because so they trust their leaders, no matter how defective those leaders are, nothing will be done, and nothing has been done in the Trump years on this issue or any other. It really is remarkable how thin the Trump record is. And it is thin 
um, at least any public spirited act. I mean, he's done a lot of graft. But on, on the things that a president w might want to do, he, he has done very little because he has not got the mechanism of leading the nation. Donald Trump can never go on TV and speak to America because he doesn't know that place. He only knows his America, and his America is becoming more isolated and is becoming uh, more of a minority. Just, can I, I would disagree with that to the, I think um, only, I, I don't disagree with your description of what has happened, but I think you're kind of blaming the victim when, when everything Trump does, even his reasonable things, even when he speaks well, I've never seen people, it's like a collective psychosis, how liberals lose their minds. Um, I mean, the, the, take something that I think, um, and, and just, you know, hear me out, it was, I think it's a perfectly reasonable policy, and it was upheld by the Supreme Court, little spoiler alert there, but what was called the Muslim ban. We are not required to take everyone from every country on earth. After the Charlie Hebdo, the um, concert massacre in Paris, after San Bernardino, after the Pulse nightclub, I really... I'm hard pressed to find a problem with Trump's speech saying we need to take a pause in countries um, with terrorists that are on the State Department terrorist watch list um, from Muslim countries until we, as he said, can figure out what the hell is going on. I, I mean, that seems eminently reasonable to me. And instantly, I mean, for a week, all I saw on TV was he's Hitler, he's Hitler, he's Hitler. Then they enact it. Um, New York Times, for the first time ever, published a Grove City College writer, um, also from Cato, explaining on the op-ed page how the, I call it the Muslim ban, it was called the travel ban, um, was unconstitutional, you can't do this, um, yeah, upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, same thing w with, um, with his wall funding. I mean, over and over again, he takes reasonable steps. The fact that he says hell and damn and has a very limited vocabulary really isn't a problem compared to Republican after Republican after Republican lying to the voters, getting us to vote for them, and then betraying us. Um, I mean, that, that, how do you have a democracy? We're watching it uh, sort of, I mean, I think we're watching it, sort of feeling sorry for the British. What on earth is going on? They voted for Brexit two years ago. I'm telling you, we've been doing this for 40 years, and that's why people got fed up and voted for Trump. And it is, it is, and um, if he's watching, you're doing a terrible job, Mr. President. You've got to pedal to the metal on those promises. But um, if he weren't Donald Trump, if he hadn't made those promises, if his rally cry had not been at every single rally, build the wall, if he were Jeb, if he were President Rubio, which of course could never happen, um, and, were do and had done the exact same things, I'd think I'd died and gone to heaven. So compared to any of the others, he's done stuff, but he hasn't done the stuff he does have the constitutional authority to do, and he could do. So wh what, what the Muslim ban meant in real life was that um, if an American family, citizens who were Muslim, wanted to have mother-in-law visit them to spend a few weeks with the grandchildren, she couldn't do that. Uh, what it meant was that if you were um, a, a company and you had um, an executive who came from one of the countries, or the plan originally was that it would apply to people of Muslim faith from any country. It was then reduced to a certain number of countries. If you had an executive or a skilled person and you wanted to rotate them in, in for a while, you couldn't do it. What you did was you attacked, uh, you attacked on the basis of a religious test, the commonalities that people had. And so, you, and you drove people of, many people were not especially political, um, to take a position on something that it never occurred to them their government could ever do. And one of the, the features of the Trump years has been it la has launched a kind of mobilization of Americans against Americans in a way we, that we have never seen before. And here's a data point that drives that home. So 2010 was a big Republican year. Republicans won the House of Representatives and um, one of the um, uh, biggest flips in recent congressional history. Total number of 
votes cast. If you look at the total number of votes cast in 2010 for Republican candidates and look at the total number of votes cast in 2018, Republicans actually won more votes for the House than the, in 2018 than they won in 2010. Democrats won 9 million more votes than that. You have this, and what, what is going to happen in 2020 is you're going to have an unprecedented Republican mobilization, but you're going to have an even bigger and more unprecedented Democratic mobilization. Everyone is being pulled into the political system by mutual antipathy. And when that happens, nothing gets done. The Muslim ban, there's no, there was never any case for it. It was always a, a, a wicked and foolish thing to do. But it was also a deeply unwise thing to do because if, you're if the goal is to move to a system where we take more people with skills, fewer people without, we have better enforcement to make sure that people who are in the country have a right to be here, um, and we get a grip on total numbers and we stop treating the asylum system as a secondary immigration system. If that's the goal, you need a national consensus behind it, as you need a national consensus for anything big. And when you're dividing people and alienating people and saying, you know, uh, you know, the, the head of cardiac, uh, cardiac surgery at this hospital, who because he has a Muslim last name, is a lesser American than anybody else, how do you get anything done? Who wants to live in such a country? Now, as you respond to that, we've been talking about the travel ban. And it reminds me that Trump has been doing a lot of his immigration policy through executive yes. action. So I'm curious how you feel about that and, and how that squares with, I think, more traditional conservative philosophy that seeks to rein in the executive branch. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is actually a, a falsity. Um, sometimes people get ginned up on particular you know, one thing that was wrong, I mean, another one that's similar to it. I mean, exec there's nothing the matter with an executive order if it's within the executive's constitutional authority. Similarly, um, the left used to c claim um, that what conservatives objected to about Supreme Court rulings was they overruled a, a, co a congressionally passed law. They can't do that. Um, no, we don't care who passed it. The question is, is it constitutional or not? Similarly with the executive order. We don't care that there's an executive order. And one of the things I wrote about this in, in Trump We Trust that was so, his campaign was just, it was magnificent in so many ways. And one of the ways was 99% of the things Trump was promising he didn't need Congress for. It is 100% within the authority of the executive. Um, and it's been done over and over again. I don't think there's anything wicked about the Muslim ban. I know a lot of Muslims are very happy to, to hear it. They had fled these countries because of the terrorism. Um, they wanted to live in a country that wasn't going to have pulse nightclubs. They would have people look at them less suspiciously if we cut down on San Bernardinos and so on and so forth. Um, you can work out getting the doctors in. Um, but we've done it over and over again. I mean, we've discriminated on the basis of nationality, on race, on religion. Um, not only is it the job of the executive? Immigration is an extension, as the Supreme Court has found over and over and over again, of foreign policy, which is the province of the executive. But, you know, just to be extra sure, Congress wrote a law saying the president may, in the interests of the United States, um, exclude any category of people. Um, for, for about 30 years, uh, there was a religious di discrimination on, on immigration in favor of Jews from Russia. We had national discrimination in favor of Vietnamese, um, and so on and so forth. And after, you know, terrorist attack after terrorist attack, it is kind of striking. I mean, maybe I'll be proved wrong this next week, but we haven't had any more San Bernardinos. And, and one other thing, and I can't, I can't attack David for this because I know we agree on this, but what you often hear from the left, um, is an argument like yours that, of course, I'm sympathetic to, we're all sympathetic to. Yes, we want the Muslims who are the cancer researchers. Um, whenever we're arguing about immigration, suddenly we hear about the cancer researchers. And then you look at the numbers, and it's 90 percent, you know, landscapers and pushcart operators. Um, exactly what you say, yes, it's not just numbers. We're the New England Patriots. We want to be going around getting the best high school football players, not just, ah, oh, yeah, we had to take him, but he's, I know he's blind and weighs 99 pounds, but it's Tom Brady's cousin. We got to take him. That's our immigration policy. 
Yes, move it to we're taking cancer researchers and nobody cares, Muslim, non-Muslim, Vietnamese country, this, that, or the other thing. But by the way, when Trump has tried to do that, when he has tried to say, we don't want people who come to our country who immediately need government assistance. What kind of country would do that? I, I mean, of all the cutoffs in the world, it doesn't even have to be nuclear scientists, but how about you don't come here and immediately need government assistance? Um, that seems like a good cutoff. Trump has pushed it just in the last week or two, um, and, and once again, I'm hearing claims of Hitlerianism. In, in the first six months of 2019, the number of people crossing the southern border reached about 100,000 a month. And they arrived and they made an asylum claim. Um, and those asylum claims were pretty clearly unfounded. Um, but nonetheless, there was a system of law and treaty that governs how asylum seekers are treated that made it very difficult for the United States to do anything about that. Now, if you want to do something about that problem, you're going to need to change the law and you're going to need to change some treaties. And you're going to need Congress with you. You're going to need the public with you. Um, and immigration is an issue that now impinges so much. Immigration, immigrants and their children are something like now about a fifth of the country. Um, and even, even though immigration at very high levels has uh, its most direct economic harm on the most recent immigrants, people also vote their values. Immigrants too, just like everybody else. And no one will support you if, you are, if they're being insulted. Uh, that the process of arriving at an immigration reform is going to be done in the context of doing other things too. If you think of immigration reform as in, a, a part of a context of um, in constantly seeking the best human capital for the United States, not only from around the world, but here at home. Um, immigration is related to the reasons why we have things like early childhood nutrition programs. Uh, it's related to why we uh, need to think about moving the beginning of education from first grade and kindergarten earlier and earlier so that people, Americans, both whether their parents are born here, whether their parents are immigrants, have the fairest chance. And it is connected to re-knitting these bonds of solidarity that for so many Americans are expressed through anxieties about their health insurance. Now to do all of that, you're going to need political leadership that can work with others and can speak to the whole country, including those who arrived here yesterday. I mean, when Donald Trump says something about, um, tells uh, a naturalized citizen um, to go back where you came from, I'm a naturalized citizen. I don't take that very personally because I know he doesn't mean naturalized citizens who look like me. Uh, he means naturalized citizens who look like something else. Um, and no one, no one, will, no one will stand with you if they feel dis devalued and disrespected. And the essence of Donald Trump's appeal is his ability to project disrespect. That's what he does. That's why, unfortunately, some people like him, but that's why so many more don't. And that's why his administration is going to be so void of accomplishment. And when it's all over, and it's going to be over, I think, pretty soon and in a pretty dramatic way, what, when it's all over, all those executive orders are going to be blown away like so much dust because the next president can change them. Enduring change comes from the hard work of building permissive political coalitions. And Donald Trump can't do that work, and as a result, the things he does care about are not going to last. The things he doesn't, he cared about less are not going to last. All that's going to last is the harm, the attack on American alliances, um, and the mutual anger among American citizens. It's going to be a tougher country to govern in the 2020s because of him. Um, can I... Um, a, few, a few points on that. First of all, that's why a wall is a great idea. Um, it, it's forever. It's not an executive order. Uh, it works. They work all over the world. It works in China. It works in Israel. Yes, there are airplanes, but it's a lot easier to stop people and ask for their papers. I mean, it takes two hours if you're an American citizen arriving at JFK to get through customs as opposed to having a wide open border. But I mean, that's part of what has annoyed me about, about Trump ask, acting like, you know, his hands are tied with the asylum laws that do need to be changed. Um, I, no, of course nobody wants these, these families dragging poor little kids, dying in the desert, being raped in the desert, being killed. No, we don't want that. That's why we don't want our country to be a magnet. That's why we don't want to give them free public benefits. That's why we don't want to have a wide open border, a wall, and they're not going to make that journey. That's among the fantastic reasons for a wall. As for bringing the country together and his language, 
um, and the importance of it. I don't disagree with the importance of it, but I just, I'm always reminded of that New Yorker cartoon with a Greek looking at a man saying, I was hoping for a taller, honest man. Um, okay, Trump isn't everything, but after betrayal, 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 I'll take some coarse language. Um, point three, um, I, I think you are wrong that Hispanics and Muslims in this country are put off by this. I think white social justice warriors and college students are put off by it. And my example of that is, um, because, oh my gosh, they were hysterical on MSNBC, ABC, ABC, CBS about the Mexican rapist speech. And I, I often spend Christmas in Palm Beach. I'm going around to Christmas parties. This is 2017 after the Mexican rapist speech, after all kinds of wild language used by Trump. And people had warned me about this, but I saw this going to Christmas parties in Palm Beach. Someone whose name you all know, I'll tell you afterwards, um, was walking around. They were all shell-shocked in Palm Beach, but one in particular, he just kept going up to people at parties saying, I don't understand. We were all for Jeb, but the Hispanic help is all for Trump. And the reason, part of the reason for that is, and why I kind of grimaced when I, even I said Hispanic, as I say in Adios America, I think Hispanic is, you know, an invented category used by ethnic grievance groups and Republican political consultants. One of my friends asked a Dominican he works with as we were having this surge across the border, um, do you feel a particular affinity with Mexicans? And she said to him, um, he's a German Jew, no, do you? Hispanics don't think of themselves as Hispanic. They think of themselves as Mexican, Puerto Rican, Ecuadorian. It's an imaginary category, so this idea that all Hispanics are upset that people are entering the country illegally on the border, underselling their jobs, their wages are the ones that are, that are be, taking a hit from all of this. Um, they don't want their you know, lazy brother-in-law sleeping on the couch. No, Hispanics, Trump got slightly more of the Hispanic vote than either McCain and Bush, so I wouldn't worry that much about the language. And as for dividing the country, yes, it's divided, but again, I say who's, I, I put the blame on the left. I've never seen anything like this. So the reason the Republicans lost the House in 2018 um, was not because of the left. Um, the Republicans lost districts like um, Texas 7, which used to be, which was re represented by George H.W. Bush in 1966. He flipped it from Democrat to Republican. It stayed Republican through Watergate, um, through Iran-Contra, through the Iraq War, through the financial crisis, and went Democrat in 2018. Um, they lost districts like Newt Gingrich's former district in Georgia, in suburban Atlanta, um, which again, had Gingrich turned it from uh, Democrat to Republican in the middle 1970s, and it stayed Republican that whole time, and went in 2018. Um, Eric Cantor's district, in the most affluent part of, just northwest of Richmond, reaching up toward uh, the District of Columbia, um, that has been Republican forever and ever. Uh, the, the district along the, just south of the Potomac River, um, past the CIA, the, one of the richest districts in America, has been Republican for 60 of the past 66 years, and it went Democrat in 2018. All four cases, by the way, the winner was a woman. Um, what you are seeing, what you are seeing is a, a turn away from the Republican Party in um, the places where the historic heartlands of the Republican Party, in a turn led by women voters, led by women representatives in Congress. Um, and it's not just social justice, I, I, you know, I, I was a president of a Federalist Society chapter. I knocked on doors for Ronald Reagan in 1980. Um, I'm offended by it. It hurt. It wounds me. And you know, I, I agree with Anne. Of course, Anne is right that Hispanic is a category that's invented in America to describe people come from uh, many different countries. But you know, how you create an identity like that is by abusing people. That people will. Uh, all identities are artificial. Um, all of them, and many of them, arise in response to hostility. Um, Americans felt more American uh, during wartime, during the Cold War, than they feel now because they felt under threat. If you don't want to subdivide your country between these different ethnic and cultural identities, treat people equally, treat them all with respect. And that is something that Donald Trump can't do. Doesn't, it's not his business model, it's not his political model. Um, he is going to leave behind a broken Republican Party. It is going to take a long time to recover. He's going to leave behind um, a sense, a, a stronger American left, because if you tell people 
If you object to abusing your fellow citizens, then you're a social justice warrior. A lot of people, well, I didn't think so, but if you tell me that, I suppose I am. But the whole point is, these are people who aren't, excuse me, who aren't our fellow citizens. They're the, they're the foreigners coming in. Um, and what I'm saying is the reason a lot of, a lot of their fellow countrymen who got in before they did um, are, are with Trump on this is they left those countries. They wanted to live in America. We need time to assimilate people. Trump isn't talking, and, and oh, one other thing I, I wanted to mention because um, I will admit that the president did one thing that was kind of dopey. Um, but his original tweet, I think, is fully, completely defensible. And that is when he was talking about Ilhan Omar. And um, um, I, I was thinking of that Indian woman from the Pacific Northwest. I forget her name. And uh, who's the other one? But there are three who actually are immigrants. And they are pushed, they are pedal to the metal pushing socialism. And Trump's tweet did not identify anyone. He said, I thought it was kind of a funny tweet, actually. He said, um, People who have uh, fled dysfunctional, corrupt countries um, who come to this country, he, I guess, I don't know if he called them the squad, um, and start bossing us around and telling us how to run our country. Hey, why don't you go back and fix your country? Then once you've done it, then you can come here and tell you how, how, how you did it. Tell us how you did it. Now, what he did that was stupid, because the, the tweet itself didn't name, and you're right, the, the, the media started throwing in that um, representative Presley, who is, of course, an African-American and a citizen. He didn't mention her, but... Instead of defending the defensible, he just sort of went along with the media's characterization of, of whom he was referring to. I think if you are referring to people who are coming in from other countries and really arguing for a dramatic change in the way we run things, I think it's a perfectly good point to say you fled a corrupt regime, your family was part of that corrupt regime, you got out you know, one step ahead of the executioner, so please don't come and tell us we have to adopt all the policies you had in your country. I mean, I just think it's rude. Let me put it that way. I wouldn't go to somebody else's country and think that I should be on TV bossing them around, running for office and telling them how to do it. And I'm coming from a pretty successful country. I just think it's rude. Um, I feel a little less comfortable pointing to the dysfunction and corruption of other countries when the president of this country is taking millions of dollars in undisclosed foreign payments every year. This... We, we, have, we are turning into Kazakhstan at a pretty impressive rate of speed, and it's disturbing. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> how, um, how much money, there's a, there's a Trump Tower Istanbul, there are two Trump Towers in Istanbul. How much money is the Trump family and the Trump organization receiving in payments from that Trump Tower in Istanbul? Is it zero? Is it $100? Is it a million dollars? Is it $10 million? What percentage of the Trump family's income comes from those towers? No one knows the answers to any of those questions. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's important. We don't know. Meanwhile, the president is making decisions that may or may not be guided by those streams of payments. And that story can be told about the Philippines. That story can be told about a lot of other places as well. The president now is trying to put his hotel in Washington on the market for $500 million, much more than anybody thinks it's worth. Um, why is the president doing it? Why does he even have a, such a hotel? Those are the kinds of things that are disturbing about our country. But let me take on another point that I think is, that is, and when we, talk, we talk about immigration amnesty and what we are going to do. Um, there's something like 12 million illegal people illegally present in the United States. Maybe more. Some, who, I, no, we, you're right. We don't know the exact number, but, but the usual guess is about 12, 12 million. It may be more. It may be less. Um, apparently, about half that population has been here for more than 10 years. Um, so it's very unlikely that they're ever returning home. Um, the peak period for illegal entry into the United States was the 1990s. So that, those people who are here for more than 10 years are probably now in their, in their 40s. And very soon, blink of an eye, they'll be in their middle 60s. Um, what happens to them then? How do we, uh, they're going to be in this country, they're going to be older, they're going to be in need of health care. What do we do about them? That the, pr the problem of settling long, set, long settled people and making sure that they have some kind of social provision, that is also going to be part of, the, of finding our way to a stable and workable immigration 
solution. And so we're all, that everyone is going to be doing things, if, if you ever do arrive at a solution, that they may have found kind of unthinkable, like making sure that long settled illegal immigrants even though they are illegal, someday enter the Medicare system because otherwise they will be in this country uncared for in their old age. And if you are going to do things like that, the people who advocate for that, uh, for that population are going to have to make some concessions. They can't, this cannot continue. We must see that the flow of illegal immigration is stopped. We must see that the asylum system is not used as a backdoor to illegal entry. Um, but we are going to have to do this together and we're going to have to build a, a, a civic spirit. Um, and Donald Trump's behavior makes all of that impossible. And we, we are going to be, and if, if you, any of the people in this room are people who are sympathetic to the president, I just ask you, when you think about the things you believe in, do you think you're going to be in a stronger position in 2022 than you are today? And I put this, I put this question to Ann. Um, I mean, you have often written about how betrayed you have personally felt by President Trump, I and mean, you have been very fierce about him. Um, everybody whoever trusts Donald Trump thinks I'm the one he's not going to break faith, faith with. But, <laughs> but he breaks faith with everybody, creditors, contractors, wives, everybody. He's going to break faith with you. I think that's an exaggeration. Um, <laughs> for one thing, this million dollars because he owns Trump hotels around. I, I think that's that's a little crazy. Um, I mean, it can be. There are examples like Barack Obama's neighbor in Chicago seems to have sold him a property that was very, very, very inexpensive and he wanted benefits from Obama. You had, um, who was it, Speaker Wright, who actually had a huge ethics violation. He'd show up, the way they he'd take money under the table is show up at, to give a speech. And But the requirement was you can't be paid for the speech if you're a member of Congress, but they can buy your book. So they'd be required to buy, you know, a thousand of his book. And, it, and they said, no, I'm sorry, this is graft. If you can prove there is graft, but I mean, everybody knew that Trump owns, owned these hotels. It's sort of unusual having a businessman go in there. I don't think you can just say because he owns hotels and he's the president now, well, therefore that's proof of corruption. And that's what I mean about people just finding him so icky. They're just so quick to, to say this must be corrupt because it involves Trump. I don't think he's dividing the country very as much as you say. I think liberals are dividing the country because they've gone crazy. But I, I mean, there's not, there's not another Republican, I can't think of another candidate that gets rallies like tr Trump does and brings the Trumpsters together, willing to take vicious attacks from Antifa, um, willing to, you know, stand online for hours and hours. Boy, a lot of us are really together that these are the policies we want. In terms of what this is going to turn into, oh, well, two things on being, one betrayed what, and then the other one, what, what this will turn into. I was much more pessimistic before Trump, even Trump not keeping his promises, because the most basic the most basic norm, you know, we're always hearing about the norms he's violating. A norm is in democracy, you present a slate of issues, this is the stuff I'm gonna do, this is what my opponent's gonna do, the people vote. And like I say, for half a century, we've been voting and they won't give it to us. They betray us, they betray us, they betray us. Now, look, George, the first George Bush also betrayed us on no new taxes. The second George Bush, um, something um, David and I go back to um, a few issues where we were the lone voices in the wilderness, and one was the first two out there opposing Harriet Myers. That was insane. We got Souter and Harriet Myers. Luckily, she didn't get through. Um, Trump has given us excellent judges, excellent justices. He totally kept his promise on that. So in terms of what kind of country it is, I think it's much more dangerous when politicians just say, screw you over and over and over again. Part of the reason so many people came out to vote for Trump is, is that he seemed crazy enough that he might actually keep his promises. And he has kept some of them, not the central one. Um, I think that's a much bigger issue of betrayal. You, do you feel he has kept faith with you? Oh, the good news is, <laughs> on that, no, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I've been a little testy with the president. <laughs> um, and I've been saying, 
you know, giving speeches over the past month or so. Look, I'm sorry if you all support Trump, but we got 13 months to get him to keep his promises because either he loses and we don't have a second term or he wins and he's not running for re-election again so he doesn't have to keep his promises. And then it, then it will be nothing but pushing Trump, Trump hotels. Um, and then I realized with this latest impeachment thing, they're never going to stop trying to remove Trump from office. They are never, ever going to stop. The entire left and the entire media's position is, get this monster out of my sight. And it doesn't matter. They will grab on to any attack in a storm. They're never going to, to stop. So I realized, actually, to my delight, that they're never going to stop. If he wins a second term, he's going to have to worry about impeachment and removal. So we'll still have a cudgel to force him to keep his promises. But um, if you or Jared are watching, <laughs> you got to build 400 miles of the wall before next November. We, uh, David, we have a couple more minutes left, yeah. but I want to get your quick take on looking ahead to 2020. How much do you think Trump and how much do you think the Democrats will run on immigration as the top issue? Um, I think it is going to become an, an issue that is very central. Uh, the Democrats will um, go very left on it. Uh, that uh, The Barack Obama of 2008 would be completely unnominatable um, in the Democratic Party of today. Uh, and of course, Trump will I, th I think Trump actually would be more cautious about the immigration issue than the Democrats because at this point it does cut against him. Uh, but it's going to be central and that's going to make it harder to solve. Because Anne's model of how politics works maybe describes a parliamentary democracy like Britain, Canada, or Australia. There's a part, the two parties offer their platforms, one wins, it implements it. That is not how it works in the United States. There isn't a government, there isn't an opposition. Candidates run on proposals, and then everyone understands that the real bargaining happens after the election. Um, that's uh, the, the, the Affordable Care Act that Barack Obama passed in 2010 doesn't look a lot like what he campaigned on in 2008, and the same will be true for the Democrats with their health care plans. To make those kinds of negotiations work, you need to build a consensus, and you need, above all, a president who can go on television, speak to the country, and rally it. And Donald Trump has never even tried to do that because there's something, the one bit of self-knowledge that he has is that he is not the president of the United States. He's the president of 45% of the United States. I don't think he thinks that. Um, and no, I know there are compromises, David. Um, but what I'm talking about with immigration is way more than, oh, we had to make a compromise. It is just outright betrayal. Yep, we ran on immigration and screw you voters, the donors want their cheap labor. It was with McConnell, it was, and, and they gave quotes at the time um, like I say, before the 2014 election, they're all promising right and left, you want us to stop Obama's unconstitutional executive amnesty, you got to give us a majority in the Senate. And by the way, voters were a little down on Republicans. Some of the, there was that Tea Party spirit out there, there were still some, some Tea Party type style candidates primarying incumbent Republicans. I was on TV saying, no, Republicans, please don't vote for the Tea Party candidate now. We just need a majority. First you get a majority, then you improve the Republican who's already there. They win in a huge landslide that year. And then George Will, among others, and Mitch McConnell, they say, well, it's not fair because um, the media will blame us if we, quote, shut down the government. Oh, well, you didn't tell us you, you wouldn't do it if it was hard if you had only told us and left the media opposes us. That isn't what they said when they were running. It was an outright betrayal. Marco Rubio promising he would never push amnesty um, in the Senate because he had been very bad in the Florida legislature, which is why Joyce Kaufman asked him about it on his radio show, made him promise on his mother's life. He gets to the US Senate, first bill, amnesty. That isn't we had to compromise. That is an outright betrayal, and why? Because the donors want the money. Um, they want the cheap labor, and they want to make more money, and they don't care about this country. They don't care at all. One thing that sort of surprised me, I mean, I never realized how much I, I hated the Republican Party until Trump came along. Um, the official Republican Party, um, I hope it is remade more in Trump's image. Um, of running on popular issues, being able to vote on this basket of issues and not, oh, we're going to throw out popular things and then betray you once, once you're in. Um, I, hope, I hope we do get that with Trump. That would be a nice yeah. change. But thus far, Republicans seem very, very it's slow learners. You know, the 1986, I wanted to mention this, the 1986 amnesty 
when I was riding Adios America, I was wondering, because we've done this before. I mean, it's not like, well, I wonder what will happen if we pass an amnesty. No, it creates a magnet. There were 3 million illegals then. Within 10 years, there were 11 million illegals. So I was wondering, what happened to the employer sanctions? Because there was, there was, you know, there was a trade-off. We're, we're going to amnesty the 3 million here, but we're going to secure the border, and there will be brutal employer sanctions if you hire an illegal alien. Well, you know, most of the illegal aliens, I mean, they are hard workers. They're lovely people. I bear them no ill will. I just want to raise the wages of my fellow Americans. Um, so what happened to that? It was Republicans who stopped it because their donors wanted the cheap labor. It was my own party that stopped the employer sanctions. The Democrats want more and more of the third world coming here for the votes, and the Republicans want it for the cheap labor. We've been betrayed so many times. Trump, if he does keep his promises on immigration, and he doesn't have much time left, he'll deserve to be on Mount Rushmore. So we, we got to wrap it up, yeah. but do you want to, I can give you a very quick response. I'll just say in opposite, uh, Anne has been a much more central person in the Republican world than I have. I've been sort of on the outs for a, a while on many issues. But one of the things that Donald Trump has taught me is actually the Republican Party is precious to me. I, I care about it, um, and he's breaking it as he's breaking so many other things I care about. Um, and he's going to break, if you care about the immigration issue, he's going to break that too. He has never kept faith with anyone in his life. He will not keep faith with you. Well, I just want to say I appreciate the chance to have a civil conversation about immigration, to get into the contrasting views, but also a couple areas where you agree as well. Let's give a big round of applause to Anne and David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.